All right. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to the, this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to begin tonight in chapter 22, verse 22. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I want uh, Brother Eric and Brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, the homo. And uh, that's all you need to know. Back to you. Hey, everybody. Brother Stephen here tonight. You know, also known as Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube. Having, you know, apparently camera problems, so I'm just going to be talking from my profile picture tonight. All right, very good. Uh, I hope uh, anybody watching this video, please uh, subscribe to uh, their YouTube channels. Um, all right, uh, let's get right into this. Uh, I'm going to, as usual, I, I read the verse in the KJV first, and then we'll look at it also in the Amplified Translation. Uh, verse 22, Rob not the poor, because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. I read two verses because they, I could see that they were connected together. Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. That ought to be pretty easy for you guys to explain. Yes, uh, I agree. And uh, a lot of things changed when uh, Jesus went to the cross. But uh, all those verses regarding how to treat the poor, none of that changed. Okay, back to you. Yeah, definitely, you know, very straight, you know, for, like, don't rob from the poor because, you know, they don't have anything. Of course, I guess, you know, when I look at poor, it reminds me of, you know, poor in spirit, but then again, right here, we're actually talking about, you know, the poor here at this point. That's all I have now. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's it's a good point because there is another type of poorness or poverty, and that is poor in spirit. But here we're talking about people that just don't have much uh, material things. Maybe they're lacking. They don't have a much uh, how much of a house to live in, if any. Uh, maybe they they have only one pair of shoes, if that. And uh, maybe they're just trying to get just enough food to. Ex get by each day and these people are just barely making it and uh, for someone to rob from them it's uh, I'm sure yeah, anybody watching this you'd probably find that to be despicable and it, it certainly seems to be something that uh, the, the Lord also says this is really horrible I and mean, there's a lot of horrible things we can do in our lives but this is something it seems that uh, it, Anybody could see that it's a bad thing to do, and yet there, there are people that do it. I mean, I, I, I've seen people on the news recently. Uh, they're, they're showing like, a, like real TV or, or a, a caught on camera. There's a couple of shows like that on TV where they have cameras running and, and you have real things actually being caught on the cameras. And it, it, it's horrible. Some some old people who are weak and feeble, and people are beating them up and stealing from them. And, uh, it, it seems like there's how low can a person go? Um, I even think that not just an individual stealing from a poor person is horrible, but I also think that in in, in our government, uh, you know, we certainly don't want to tax people who don't have much, barely enough to get by. Why should they have to pay taxes? Uh, I don't want to get too much in, off into to politics, but the kind of tax system that I think is correct is that the, the people who are barely getting by shouldn't have to pay any taxes. I mean, they're barely getting by as it is. Uh, so the government can rob the poor, and, and then, of course, we know that individuals can rob the poor. I'll read it in the Amplified and then let you make some final comments on that. It says... Uh, uh, verse 22 and 23 in the Amplified. Do not rob the poor because he is poor and defenseless, 
nor crush the afflicted by legal proceedings at the gate where the city court is held. For the Lord will plead their case and take the life of those who rob them. It's quite a warning. Any, any final remarks on that? Uh, I think we covered it pretty well. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely definitely a warning there. But yeah, I think we covered it well. We just you shouldn't be you know screwing with the poor anyway because I mean they're already low and they're already you know they barely have anything to get by anyway. So yeah, we shouldn't be messing with them. And that's all I have for now. Yeah, what kind of a hard-hearted or cold-hearted person? I would even do something like that. Let me go back to the KJV verse 24 now. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So again, verse 24 and 25 are, are connected. <clears throat> All right, guys. Okay, now... Uh... This is why the Lone Ranger can't have no friends. Only Tonto can be his friend. Because, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Lone Ranger is an angry man. And because of the previous two verses is why he's an angriest angry man. But the good news is we can have fellowship with the Lone Ranger. So, uh, there you go. Back to you. Alright. Alright, there we go. Um, well... Looking at those ones, it's just saying that you really shouldn't, I guess, make too much of an association with, you know, someone who's like, you know, angry that lashes out and is just very impulsive. Otherwise, you're just going to kind of, you know, it's like you are who your friends are for, like, in some way. It's like you just hang out with them and then you, and you, it causes you to become angry and impulsive. So you shouldn't be around that, you know, and learn that type of a way and think that's okay because that's not how we're, you know, called to be. And that's all I have for now. Hmm. Um, well, this is talking about uh, don't make friends with an angry man, but the same idea could be expanded to all kinds of people. Don't make friends with a dishonest person. Don't make friends with a a blasphemous person. Now, we could make quite a list of people that we should not befriend. There's been quite a few verses already as we've gone through this study of Proverbs uh, talking about this idea of uh, being very careful when we make friendships. Uh, I believe that uh, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life with friendships. Uh, there, there was a verse, I don't remember what chapter it was, but it wasn't too far back. And it was talking about, you know, don't to be too quick to make friends. Uh, and what, I, what I've done is that I could probably name about a half dozen names of people over, the, over my whole lifetime that have become friends of mine. Nobody else would have anything to do with them because they were, you know, incorrigibles. They're just rude, obnoxious, abrasive people. No one wanted to have anything to do with them. And for some reason, um, I felt sorry for them. I was kind. And it, uh, because because I was nice to them, they, they like attached themselves to me. And now I'm their best friend. I'm their only friend. So I'm their best friend. And then sometimes that friendship goes on for years. Um, and I'm thinking I'm trying to do a good thing and be a friend to someone, and yet eventually I had I had to cut them off because even though I could tolerate their behavior, uh, their behavior was bad to my other friends and my family, and it was unfair of me to expose my friends and family to an angry man. So um, this idea of making friendships is uh, it's a very tricky thing I I've, I've also made a lot of friendships I thought here on YouTube too and it, it just seems like uh, it, a lot of times this idea of friendship is uh, it can be very disappointing because uh, it uh, 
it, it's kind of a fragile thing. Um, all right, well, I'm not going to uh, go any further on that. Anything else you want to add? Well, the only thing I didn't really mention is that uh, not only can it harm you and the other people around you, but it also could affect your state of mind, and you might pick up some bad behavior. It might rub off on you. So, so those are the reasons you just don't be careful when you're making friends, especially don't make a friend with an angry man. All right, I'll go on unless you want to comment further on that verse. Well, I didn't read it in the Amplified yet. So let me see, it's 24. Let me read in the Amplified just to see how they phrase it. Do not associate, oh, it says, do not even associate with a man given to angry outbursts, or go along with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his undisciplined ways and get yourself trapped in a situation from which it is hard to escape. All right, I'll go back now to the uh, KJV, and we're looking at verse 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. All right. You understand that one? Seems like uh, all these verses are coming in pairs. Uh, did you not want to read the next verse as well? I looked ahead and didn't think it was related. Let me see. Let me read it and see if it is. If um, There's a period there after verse 26, but it says, If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? I don't see the connection to those two verses, but go ahead and explain it to me. Well, he's talking about... Uh financial obligations and uh, such things. Uh, that's about all I can say about that. What do you think, Stephen? Well, I mean, looking at those verses, like, you know, be not one of them that strikes hands or that are sureties for debts. You know, if you have nothing to pay, why would he, you know, take away the bed from under the... It's like basically just don't make any, you know, foolish financial decisions when... Actually, you know, really, in any case, I would say don't make any snap, you know, bad financial decisions. But especially when you're already, you know, as it says here, when you already, you know, have nothing, you know, going. Like, there's no point in trying to get into like other deals when it's just gonna like really, you know, come back to bite you here. And that's all I got for this one. Uh, okay, be before I go to the amplified, we'll probably ex uh, explain it better. Uh, I'll get give you a chance to. Explain to me the word surety and the term striking hands. Now, striking hands would be a handshake. Uh, now, uh, well, not nowadays anymore, but uh, in our glorious past, most deals were uh, done with the, by word of mouth and a handshake, uh, but not anymore, uh, unfortunately. And a surety, well, I think everybody ought to know what a surety is. A surety is some sort of a... a a debt that's been uh, uh, help me out here. <laughs> Brother Stephen, are you going to try to define surety for me before I go on? I really don't have too much to say about that because actually, you know, I don't really hear that term that much, so I'm not actually too certain. Yeah, a surety is something that's backed up by some sort of uh, amount of money. Uh, uh, well, I figured it was something like that. Well, I think in the, the context we're using surety this now, and, and as it's, we've seen the word surety come up probably a dozen times already in all these previous chapters, and it means that you're co-signing for someone's loan. You're, you're agreeing, you're shaking hands and saying, okay, uh, I'll be responsible if, for your debt. I'll co-sign for you. Uh, let me read it in the Amplified. Let's see how they phrase it. Uh, verse 26 and 27 says, Do not be among those who give pledges involving themselves in others' finances 
or among those who become guarantors for others' debts. If you have nothing with which to pay another's debt when he defaults, why should his creditor take your bed from under you? Hmm. Well, I think that should be very helpful. Uh, anything else before we go to the next verse? Uh, nowadays, they will take your bed out from under you. Okay. Yeah, definitely a lot more clear. You know, after being read in the Amplified, definitely because now it makes, because now it's talking about you know getting involved with other people's debts and not just your own at this point. Uh, all I got for this one. Yeah. Um... Of course, as we read Proverbs, you know, it, it's telling us the this is what I want you to do in your life, and this is what I don't want you to do in your life. It's it's, it's do's and don'ts, wise uh, wise ways to live your life and foolish ways to live your life. And so, as we read these, we got to think, of, hey, this is something I need to actually adapt or adopt uh, as part of my life and my, the, my way of thinking. And it would be very foolish to, to be a co-signer for someone else's debts. So you just, just don't do it. It, it usually turns out, uh, if you say no, if someone wants you to co-sign and be responsible for their debt, or even lending money, someone wants to borrow money or wants you to co-sign, um, if, if, if you want to give them money, it's one thing, but lending or co-signing, uh, you're better off just saying, uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it, or won't do it, or whatever. Because the question is, if you give them, the, let them lend them the money, then probably two things are going to happen. You're going to lose your money, and you're going to lose your friend. If you say, no, I, I will not co-sign for you, you lose your friend, but you still have your money. <laughs> so I think it's wise to just discipline yourself. Uh, if you, There's ways to help people, but this is not the right way to help people, co-signing. All right, I'll go on. Now let me see. Verse 28 in the KJV. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set, Oh, yeah, I love this verse very much. I think about it all the time. Uh, the way I apply it is, uh, well, you know, uh, my Uncle Dwayne, uh, he raised me uh, from a child, and uh, he uh, taught me uh, the way of the fundamental Christian faith. And uh, I've stuck to that in my older age without... Uh, too many changes, and I think uh, this is what that's referring to. All right, Brother Stephen, uh, how do you see that verse? Honestly, as of right this second, I don't have much to say about it, but maybe after we talk about it a little bit more and read it in the Amplified, I'll have a little bit more of a comment to make on that. Okay, um, I would not have thought of it in that way, uh, Brother Eric. Um, I'm going to be, when we look at the Amplified, I'll be interested in their interpretation of it, but when I see ancient landmarks, I mean, I think of all the times that um, the, uh, the great um, characters of the Bible, like Solomon and David and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and others, Moses, uh, it was very common that for them to to put a pile of rocks up and say this is a monument, this is, this is a landmark, and to so people can go back there and always remember some, something that happened at a particular time at that location. And uh, that's that's what I think of when I say when I when I read that verse um, that let's respect these landmarks. If somebody built a landmark if uh, they thought it was important enough that they, they, they wanted a particular historic event to be remembered, they built a landmark there that we should never remove it. Um, 
but let me see uh, what it says in the Amplified. 28, um, do not move the ancient landmark at the boundary of the property which your fathers have set. Hmm. Okay, so that would, your interpretation is definitely the correct uh, literal interpretation, and what I interjected uh, was uh, another perspective, uh, more spiritual perspective, I suppose. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is something that's worth repeating again. I've said it before, but uh, you know, we, a lot of times we have new people watching, and they they didn't hear the things that we said last week or last year. But uh, when we take a look at a verse in the Bible, there's various applications of the verse. You have a historical application. And that would be the kind of uh, translation that that I offered, and that the that the uh, amplified offered on that verse. And then you have a, a spiritual uh, application, and and uh, and there's there's just as much merit and value and, and validity in the spiritual applications too. Uh, and then there's something else that I think is uh, very common, and that's a personal application. Like in your case, I think it was personal because that verse had a particular meaning to you personally based upon some experiences you've had in the past with the verse. So, and that, that those, these are all valid ways of, uh, you know, learning from a verse. Um, but the personal applications could be totally opposite. I might have a personal uh, thing that I get out of a verse personally because of my life's experiences and my various ways of understanding things and and you you might get something totally different than me and and uh, they're both valid in that way but but the one thing that cannot be argued and disputed and there's no room for flexibility is the historical application all right uh, let me go to the next verse the final verse in this chapter it says um, verse 29 Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. I love this verse. Uh, I wanted to hear from Stephen, though. Uh, maybe he had a personal interpretation of the previous verse. I was... Okay. What do you think? Well, I mean, I didn't really have a personal one for the last verse, but I kind of agree with what, you know, Luke said in the last one. But, all right, well, looking at verse 29 now, you know, I see, as it says, a man diligent, you know, like, as I say, you know, like a, like a hard worker saying, oh, he shall stand before kings, you know, and he shall not stand before me. It's like, basically, it's like, I guess I would think about it, you know, a man who's being diligent, you know, hardworking would be, you know, successful, you know, in that type of sense. But that's just what, like, that's what I think about this, at least. That's about all I've got until after we check it out in the Amplified. Yes, you know, I've, I've always loved this verse so much. Uh, I applied it to my own uh, working career, and uh, I've never had to work for a mean boss, and I always was diligent, and... Uh, and I looked at it like that. Okay. Um, I, I I'm not sure that I'm going to be correct in, on this and the the worst of the the use of the word mean m e a n in that verse. Um, we could think that a mean man is someone that's mean spirited, angry, abusive, that kind of meanness. I think that's the way that you you interpret it, brother Eric. But the word mean also means uh, the, the middle point. Um, like if you have numbers and statistics and you have, you have an average and you have a mean, a mean is a certain point that's the midpoint. Um, so that might mean just like average men. In other words, uh, if you're diligent in business, you're going to be able to associate with kings instead of just the average people. Uh, I'm not sure, but let me see if the Amplified has... 
sees it like that or not. It says, uh, do you see a man skillful and experienced in his work? He will stand in honor before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. So I think that obscure is kind of the word that I, I was looking for too. All right, guys. Um, that's that chapter. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, any, anything else before we move forward? That was a great uh, rendition of that last verse. Yeah, especially about the mean, you know, being average, because you know that's, you know, a big statistical term about being, you know, the average thing. But yeah, definitely, you know, someone who's, you know, hardworking, skilled, you know, and successful is going to, you know, be around, you know, that higher class than to be around, you know, the average type of people. All right, so that's all I got here. Let's go on to chapter twenty-three. Okay, let's go forward here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 1. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. One more verse. Be not desirous of his dainties... <laughs> For they are deceitful meat. Wow. Okay, this is a very heavy, weighty uh, warning. Uh, and oftentimes I've thought about this verse. And uh, when I did sit down and I was offered uh, uh, goodies uh, from uh, uh, certain people, uh, I would always try to be careful, uh, you know, not to be a pig, uh, because of this verse. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have that willpower. <laughs> hmm. Well, I mean, I definitely have a very big appetite, ashamedly. But anyway, um, yeah, it says, you know, consider diligently what is before the end. Okay, I don't know. Putting a knife to your throat, I don't know, just the way that's phrased, well, it just makes it sound like literally putting a knife to your throat. You know, if that would be a man given to appetite, it makes it, it's almost like it's saying kill yourself. But, okay, maybe I'm just saying it weird. But, and then, be not desirous of his dainties. I don't know why I've never heard that word before, but for they are deceitful meat. Hmm. I feel like the end of verse, I feel like verse 2 is a very heavy verse, though. Right, that's about all I've got for this one. Well, I, I think that it's saying put a knife to your throat if you're if you're going to make this mistake because it would be a very foolish thing to do. It It's just saying take this so seriously that you're better off cutting your throat than making this mistake. And, and that is you get an opportunity to dine with a king or someone of great wealth and they have delicacies. Uh, I guess that's dainties, uh, things that you know you've well you've dreamed of eating them, and, and uh, you know great uh, delicacies that you know you you've never had before. And now is your opportunity, and then you you want to eat a bunch of it. But uh, it's saying no, just have some restraint. Even though you have an appetite, your desire is so great, you finally have an opportunity. Like there are certain things I've I've watched. <laughs> Brother Stephen, you told me you studied cooking a little bit. You learned to cook for yourself. But for several years, I watched the Food Channel a lot and watched all the great chef shows and watched all the cooking competitions. And and I used to think, oh man, I just I wish I had the opportunity to eat some of these great delicacies, these gourmet meals that they're preparing. Uh, because my what I eat on a regular basis are just your regular mundane, ordinary types of foods. If I have a chance to eat some great delicacy and I've never had it before, it'd be very tempting to want to eat a lot of it. But it's saying restrain yourself. Don't go overboard. Show some restraint. I, I think that's what it means. But uh, I'll go before I go to the Amplified, anything else? Now where it says uh, it's a deceitful meat, uh, that's sort of uh, that's sort of hinting at uh, well maybe you're eating with the wrong crowd. 
you know? Okay. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, definitely very interesting comment there. And yeah, it definitely would be tempting to pick out like on you know delicacies like that. Well, there's some delicacies that I've seen that are kind of gross, but that's not what we're talking about, you know, here in this situation though. Well, I think it's kind of like um, another kind of comparable thing is that uh, if someone does something athletically. And they 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 win, and then and then they they just have this great celebrations, and just or, or celebrating so much, versus another person that they win, but they're they're more calm and composed, and they're not celebrating as much. Then, in other words, they're kind of acting like this is not that new to me. I'm used to winning, uh, and it's the same kind of a thing with the eating. You know, you don't want to give this rich man, this king, this impression that. Oh man, I'm just I'm just so excited about this. I've never experienced anything like this. Just be restrained and and don't give it away that oh this is this is overwhelming me how how special it is because I've never had this kind of opportunity again before. Uh, I think that could be part of this thought. Let me read it in the amplified. Uh, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, consider carefully what is set before you. For you will put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food offered to you with questionable motives. Hmm. Questionable motives. That's something we didn't even factor in. His no. motives. They just opened up a can of worms, and I'm hungry. <laughs> Mm, well, I mean, questionable motives, that's vague, but yet it makes me think of disturbing things, but, well, and you know what I mean by that. That's about all I got here. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm afraid to think about what you mean, but uh, Brother Eric, he has some experience with this kind of a verse because we've talked about this many chapters ago about the idea of receiving a gift and we thought the gift was a, a kind of a harmless thing but as we studied it we realized that these gifts are forms of bribery and uh, so the I think that that thinking could be applied to this this case here where you're sitting down with a ruler and he's he's trying to win you over and bribe you with his this meal and uh, it's, he's offering you all these great delicacies, but be careful of his motive because he wants to make you, like, obligated to him. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that, but, well, that's not what I was thinking, and I'm not mentioning what I was thinking. That's it. Well, sometimes, see, what you're doing there is, is you're actually demonstrating one of the virtues uh, that we've learned in the book of Proverbs, and that is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the restraint, not only in eating the delicacies, but the restraint of thinking before we're talking sometimes. So sometimes we don't have to say every thought that comes into our head we do need to have a filter <laughs> so, uh, that's something else we learn from from proverbs too um, I'm gonna go on KJV verse 3 no verse 4 uh, labor not to be rich cease from thine own wisdom uh, I think this continues Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not for riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Yes, this verse still holds true today. Uh, and uh, it can be compared to Jesus' words where he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And uh, everything else will be added unto you. Well, I mean, I definitely agree, you know, seek for, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God there, but it's definitely like when it says labor not to be rich, it's just basically don't just, you know, get obsessed with money about being rich 
and get obsessed about being, I mean, it's good to be successful, but you shouldn't be obsessed over, you know, like having like great wealth because as it said, you know, a man, you know, cannot serve two masters. So like you shouldn't set your eyes, you know, and just target things, you know, that are not really necessary. And that's all I have for this. Yeah, I think those are good points. Uh, uh, obviously, the the the, the uh, teaching of Jesus about uh, uh, do not uh, build up your treasures on earth. That's what riches are. Trying to get the biggest house, the best car, all the best toys, big, accumulate a lot of wealth. You spend all your life pursuing these material things, and then you die, and then you go to hell. Or even you die, and you put you had your faith in Jesus, you go to heaven, but your treasures, you can't take them with you. All that stuff's left behind. And what have you got? What treasures have you built for heaven? See, what we're doing right now, it, it may not be part of your motivation, uh, but what, what you're doing right now is a work because what we're doing, attempting to do is we're attempting to have fellowship with each other, uh, and, and that is partly a, a work and a ministry, fellowship of encouraging each other, showing each other uh, attention and love, and, and also um, encouraging each other, uh, and studying the scriptures together. And we are also have the, a ministry of teaching where we're trying to teach whoever's going to watch the video, uh, so uh, these are all works, and, and we're not doing these works so that we get to go to heaven. We know that we're going to go to heaven if we never did one work. The Bible says, to he who worketh not, but believeth in the one who justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So if, 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 none, if the three of us never did one religious work our whole life, but we believe in Jesus for our salvation, we're considered righteous and we get to go to heaven because of that one thing, our faith in Jesus. So we're not doing the, this work right now because we, we're trying to earn salvation. That's not how it works. But now, why are we doing it? Well, there's a lot of different motivations for doing works. Uh, we, we, you could be, I could be doing this now because I care about the people watching and, and we want to help them understand the Bible and put their faith in Jesus and get saved. I could be doing this because I care about the lost and I want to draw them to Jesus. Um, I, I, could, I could be doing this because uh, I, I feel that, that God wants me to do it. So I'm trying doing it because I want to please God. I, he wants us to work in some kind of ministry. Every Christian, from the moment you get born again, your ministry begins. A lot of people don't even realize that they're ministers, but every Christian is a minister. Some are failing horribly because they don't even realize what their ministry is or don't make any attempt to, to figure it out. And, and if they do figure it out, they don't really work hard at doing it. So, uh, and, and then some people take their ministry seriously and, and really want to put an effort in. Uh, None of this to get saved, and none of this so that we can keep our salvation, but we're doing it because we love the lost, and because we love the Lord and want to serve the Lord, and we want to serve our fellow man. But another motivation, of course, are the rewards, the treasures in heaven that Jesus spoke about, the treasures that, that Paul talked about at the, at the Bema Seat of Christ. So these are all fair, justif justifiable motivations for us to want to, to do what we're doing. Uh, so the point is that if you are pursuing wealth right now in this life, um, you're, you're building up treasures on earth that moth and rust can destroy, as Jesus said. But maybe, maybe you should rethink that and think, how can I build up treasures that are eternal so that when I'm in heaven, I've got treasures some people say, well, heaven's going to be good enough without any, any treasures at all. Well, it would be. And if you don't want, to, if you don't want any extra treasures in heaven, that's your, your decision, I guess. What do you guys say about that? Does that all relate to this verse? 
So this side of the cross, we can labor to be rich. Rich in heaven. So, Brother Luke, why do you do it? Well, um, I, I, out of these three possibilities, uh, because I want to save the help the lost get saved, because I want to please God, or because of treasures, um, I don't really, I don't really uh, have any any particular uh, uh, motivation in my mind. I mean, I'm not, I don't have it established. I'm going to do it for this reason. I'm doing it. I, I think I'm doing it because. The, the Holy Spirit inside me has transformed me and changed my desires. In other words, this is what I desire to do. Uh, each night at 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, I, I, I desire to talk about the Bible and have fellowship. <laughs> so I'm just doing it because I love to do it. And that's really what's, what's uh, in motivating me. Um, how about you? Well, you know, Brother Luke, I almost forgot why until you just mentioned why. And it's the same for me. Uh, ever since I was born again, I've had this burning desire to grab somebody by the neck <laughs> and tell them how much Jesus loves them. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I love doing this because... I mean, yeah, I love learning and the fellowship, but definitely just the opportunity to be able to lead someone, you know, to Jesus, to, you know, teach someone, you know, the true gospel and not any perverted gospel that, you know, anybody might have out there because there's a lot of false gospels that are, you know, sometimes just tainted in just the slightest way, but just to be able to present the true gospel, you know, that Jesus came, you know, and he paid for all of our sins and that, you know, everybody who believes on him has the free gift of everlasting life. You know, it's... You know, it's just an amazing gift that he's given us, you know, and he gave his all for it. And just, I just wouldn't want to go without spreading that to, like, anybody. Because, I mean, it's not his desire that any of us die, but that all of us come to repentance. Um, did, uh, did you brothers uh, ever see that video I made titled... Um, I just won ten million dollars from uh, Publishers Cheering House. I missed that one. Yeah, I didn't see it either. All right. I hope you make a mental note and 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 watch that. Uh, but that's that's to me a, a, another that'll show you another reason, another reason for uh, uh, for what we do. All right, particularly uh, uh, evangelism. All right, let me go. On, uh, oh, I didn't. I got to read that in the Amplified. Uh, <coughs> verse four. Uh, Do not weary yourself with the overwhelming desire to gain wealth. Cease from your own understanding of it. When you set your eyes on wealth, it is suddenly gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings, like an eagle that flies to the heavens. Well, it does make me think of something I said the other night, uh, and that is that the most precious thing that uh, that we really own is our time. Were, were you guys there when I was talking about that? Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, all the other things that we have in our lives, you know, we can... We can gain things, we can lose things, and it's it's uh, we, there's a chance of gaining more if we if we work at it. Or, but uh, time, you can't gain any time. You know, you're uh, in th this. We've been talking now for 44 minutes, and can we get that back? It's go it's gone. It's done. Uh, fortunately, we get to rewatch this video if we want to. But we, we cannot get that time back and, and decide, well, I'm going to do, do something different with that time. Time is perishable. Once it's gone, it's gone. And so that's why it's so valuable. And the time that we, we spend 
you know, you people think of spending their money on for things. You you set priorities. Well, I got priorities. I only have so much money. Uh, I got to prioritize how I spend it. Well, the same thing is how are we going to spend our time since it's it's limited and uh, we can't get any more. Well, I think we really need to think seriously about how we're spending our time. And uh, I, at least I know um, I might be wasting some time throughout my each day, but at least an hour an hour a day at least I know this is not a waste of time. Uh, all right, I'll go on unless you want to comment more on that. Yeah, time. Yeah, it's just one of those things that you can never, you know, get back. I mean, obviously, a lot of us, you know, wish we could go back in time and, you know, change things or do things over again. But then again, of course, sometimes the way it happens, it just helps us. It's, you know, for the better good of us because, you know, helps shape. Like, for me, like, I went through stuff that, you know, I wish I could take back and stuff that I wish I could redo. But, it, you know, it definitely shaped me not only into who I am, but it, you know, helped me find, you know, Jesus and to realize, you know, about his gift and about everlasting life. So, I mean, obviously, I would never trade that for anything. But, yeah, definitely, you know, just having the opportunity to just fellowship, it's definitely never an hour wasted. You know, in fact, it's just, it's an amazing hour every night, you know, being able to learn something new, fellowship. And then ultimately, you know, the best part is, you know, the last 10 or so minutes when we present the gospel. You know, that's 10 minutes, probably my favorite 10 minutes of the entire day, probably. Amen to that. I've got good news, guys. We get to, we can redeem the time. According to uh, Ephesians 5.16, maybe we should have a hangout about that. Back to you. Do you think that I have every verse in the Bible memorized? You can just quote a number and I know what it says? Okay, uh, let me uh, read it to you. I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> okay. Redeeming the time because the deeds are the days are evil. Okay, it's a short verse, but I think you would have to read the previous verse. Uh Okay, and I've lost it now. I'll uh, I'll have to get back with you on that. All right. There's a lot of verses that uh, I found that I've actually misused over the years because when you take a verse by itself, a text out of context, uh, you know, you, you could think it means one thing, and uh, but then what, it, it may have an actual really interesting, uh, valid meaning that, that is that you can say spiritually, I get this out of the verse. But then when you go look at the verse and you look at the context of the whole chapter and what it's talking about, it may not have anything to do with what you thought it was. I found that to, many, many times to be the case. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, the verse about redeeming or ta the time, I'd, I'd have to look at the whole thing in context and, and uh, try to decide, uh, uh, you know, before I even spoke about it. But let me, let me say this. Uh, the last verse, be, be, I think this will be the, the, the final verse is the one we just discussed, and is about um, time. Um, time is, you can't re recover the time. Um, so let me make a point about that, and, and then we'll ask Brother Stephen to uh, tell everybody about the gospel the good news about the free gift of salvation. But I would start say that since we've been talking about time and time is limited and you can't regain what was lost and uh, time is running out, that uh, there's some interesting verses in the Bible. The Bible says uh, uh, God has appointed a time uh, uh, for, ever, for everyone. Uh, you have an appointment with death. And you, well, you don't know when it is, but God knows in advance at the very moment and the very means by which we're all going to die. It's an appointment we have with death. Uh, and so how much time do you have left? Well, you don't know. Many times as I've been preaching on the Las Vegas Boulevard, I'll be preaching to a crowd of people and I'm interrupted because a 
an ambulance is driving down the strip and it's got a siren running and and everybody stops and looks at the siren looks at the ambulance and I say this this may be a sign from God you see the person inside the ambulance didn't expect to be there today sometimes sometimes death comes suddenly unexpectedly so you you should not take any chances thinking I'll, I'll put this subject off for another day the subject of hey am I going to go to heaven or not we need to get that resolved what made me get serious is yesterday yesterday was the anniversary of my mother's death she died 29 years ago and when she died that made me understand that uh, so the first time in my life I had to face a death of a, of a loved one and uh, I, I realized they uh, the, our mortality I mean we, we know about it as a child but until we're faced with it someone we love it's it, I think we kind of like put it off we don't want to think about it I was forced to think about it and it made me ask the questions you know what happens after we die what what is the purpose of life so um, we a lot of times we put these questions off to so some point in the future. At some point in the future, I'll get around to that. But the Bible says that uh, today is the day of salvation. Today. It says you're not promised another day. It says life is like a vapor. It, it appears for a short time and then it's gone. So time is running out for you. And... Uh, you need you need to consider the good news that Brother Stephen is going to tell you right now. Take this seriously. You may not have another opportunity. Hey, Brother Stephen. All right. Well, I'm going to turn my camera on for this because, you know, I believe I should, you know, be looking at you guys while this happens. I know I've been having camera problems, but all right, here we go. Well, and I definitely agree with what Brother Luke says, just to start this off. Because as, you know, as Jesus said, I will come like a thief in the night. And you don't want to be caught dead without Jesus and without the gift that he's given us. You know, and it's a really amazing gift. Because you know, the entire God of this universe, and then there's this planet, and then there's us. We're like the size of a grain of sand on this planet in comparison to the size of it. And then our planet is the size of a grain of sand in comparison to you know, all the stars the galaxies, you know, everything out here, you know, in the universe. But, you know, God just really loved us. So I'm just going to read one of my favorite verses before I continue. You know, you know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but hath everlasting life. You know, Jesus came here, God in the flesh, fully man, fully God, and... He lived the perfect life, the sinless life that we can never live. You know, he fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to God. He performed, you know, many miracles to prove who he was. And, of course, he spoke with, you know, divine authority. And, you know, and every word that he said, you know, is true. You know, it's come true. And he proved who he was when he rose from the dead. But, you know, but before I get to that part, let's talk about it, like, about how, we, how that happened. You know, Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins by dying on the cross, being buried, and then, you know, rising again on the third day. You know, in doing that, you know, he proved who he was, that he was God. But at the same time, he also paid, you know, the ultimate penalty, you know, for our sins. You know, he became sin and had every sin nailed to him on that cross and crucified with him. You know, and suffered, you know, the punishment and the wrath of God, you know, that we all deserved. Because, you know, there's no man righteous, you know, not one. And, you know, our works are as filthy rags before God, and there's nothing that we can do to ever earn salvation. You know, as it says here in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Because Jesus paid it all for you. There's nothing that we can do to ever pay for it. And there's nothing we could do to ever earn it because we're always going to come up short. I mean, you can try to be as faithful as you want. You can be as obedient as you want. You can do any religion that you want. 
there's no other way. For as Jesus said in you know John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. And the thing is, you know, Jesus loves you to death to the point where he laid down his life for you, you know, gave up everything just to make sure you'd have everlasting life. And all you have to do to get everlasting life is accept the invitation, which is to believe on Jesus, you know, and trust in him and in him alone that, you know, that the price that he paid was, was enough to pay for your sins and not anything you could do. For as Jesus said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Every time Jesus said verily, verily, it always came true because he always commanded divine authority. So he is not going to take this promise back. You know, God will not lie to you, and he's never going to take back his promises or his gifts. And this is just the ultimate gift. You know, it's your eternity, you know, salvation. And just the amazing thing is, you know, he paid it all. There's another verse to back up. In Acts 16, you know, verses 30, this, I'm skipping the first few words, but one man asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It also says, And thine house. It's just very simple. All you have to do is believe you know, and trust on Jesus and in him alone. You know, he paid it all for you, you know, giving up his life, you know, coming here in the flesh, you know, that's just the ultimate, you know, humbleness. You know, he was the God of this universe. He doesn't have to do this. But he came here because he loved us. No matter how small or how wicked or evil we were. And he still paid, you know, the ultimate price. And this is another thing, you know, it says the wages of sin is death in Romans six twenty three. You know, this is something we deserved and something that we've worked for. You know, we deserve to die. We deserve to go to hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, and he's giving us a free gift that he paid for with his death. And all you have to do is just believe. And, but it's not something, it just sounds so simple, but that's really how the gospel is. And the best part is, once you have the gift, you'll never lose it. John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And that's the best part. You know, come to Jesus, and not only will you be saved, but you'll be given assurance, you know, forever. Like, you'll never have to worry about it, like, ever, you know, worrying about salvation ever again. Because, you know, Jesus paid it all, and he's not ever going to take back his promise. You know, that's just, it's just beyond amazing. The fact that, you know, that God would be willing to do something like that, you know, for us. You know, it's beyond just meeting in the middle. Like, he literally did everything for us. And all we have to do, you know, is believe, you know, and accept the invitation. And that's something I would pray that every single one of you would do. And I really wouldn't want to put it off, you know, as easy as it sounds. It might just be like, oh, all I have to do is believe, so I'm going to do, go and do all this, then I'll believe later. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Because as Jesus did say, I will come like a thief in the night. And as Luke said, you don't know when your time is. I mean, I'm not trying to be evil here, but, you know, it could be tonight could be your last night on earth. And, you know, what would it profit you if you were to gain the whole world and lose your whole soul? I mean, rather than just take this gift that Jesus gave you, he's extending it to you. And all you have to do is believe. It, I just encourage you guys, don't put this off. Definitely, you know, come to Jesus and live. And that's all I have to say about this. All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother brother Eric. What, what would you like to say? Still there? Maybe he's not there. Let me see. Oh, he's muted. Why is he muted? I, I didn't mute you. He went on and off several times in the middle of my presentation. I noticed that. Yeah, Maybe he's just experiencing technical difficulties right now. Oh, man, what's going on? Uh, something's going on with the Internet. No, when you, uh, when you joined back in, you had to get approved again, so I just approved you. Okay. All right. All right. Anyway, so, back to uh, what, uh, what would you like to say? Um, 
uh, Brother Stephen, explain the gospel, and what would you like to say before we finish for the night? I would like to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for giving us his free gift of salvation, and I would like to uh, lead whoever has received that free gift into uh, a prayer, thanking Jesus for that salvation. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give me new life. I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, consider yourself thanked up. Okay, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll just say that uh, in the description box of all my videos I have a statement of faith and a list of verses uh, that uh, support everything that Brother Stephen said so if you want to see where he's getting his sayings from uh, you can go right and, and see those verses and see that that's exactly what the Bible does say alright so I hope you will put your faith in Jesus tonight receive the free gift of salvation Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. Join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific Time.